Okay. Hello, everyone. I need to change that photo. <laughs> that's, that's what that made me think. Um, so, it's a kind of interactive uh, webinar. So, as I'm sure you all, all know already, um, one of the things we do with the network is we fund uh, feasibility studies. And we ask those feasibility studies to be aligned with certain themes. And uh, this time round, in the second iteration of the network, we've introduced some new themes. So in particular, uh, in, in this session, we're discussing the theme socio-technical data-rich systems. So um, we're going to have like an interactive whiteboard session uh, soon. And I'll give you some instructions about how, how we're, we're going to do that and why we're doing it. Um, but first, we have a, a, a short presentation around this theme from Chris Turner, who's a lecturer in uh, business analytics at the University of Surrey. And, uh, hello and welcome to this uh, presentation on socio-technical data-rich systems in manufacturing, uh, or uh, why human in the loop is necessary for automation. Uh, my name is uh, Chris Turner. I'm uh, from uh, the Surrey Business School at the uh, University of Surrey. So what do we mean by socio-technical data-rich systems? Well, in the opinion of uh, many authors, uh, these are systems that require a human in the loop still. So highly automated systems, but still require some uh, mediation by, by the human. Certainly we've seen the rise of uh, certainly automation and autonomous manufacturing in uh, many uh, sectors of manufacturing. But that does actually raise uh, the issue of uh, trust in such uh, automated systems. And this indeed is another reason why human in the loop is still needed. There's also uh, the uh, factor of changing consumer markets. Uh, so we've seen obviously uh, the rise of uh, mass customization. There's also the concept of uh, mass personalization, uh, also called by some uh, the uh, production in batches of uh, size one or really sort of uh, highly personalized uh, products being produced for uh, individual customers. Uh, we also have the factor of uh, certainly uh, the use of intelligent systems in many automated and indeed autonomous systems are indeed very difficult to interpret by, by humans. And there is a case of uh, how exactly do we uh, communicate what an intelligent system is doing on our behalf back to a human in an understandable uh, understandable way, perhaps or sort of process with maybe uh, stage gates uh, that a human can actually understand and uh, uh, interact with. One of the major drivers for the introduction of uh, new technology within manufacturing, uh, especially technologies uh, concerned with automation and autonomous uh, behaviours in manufacturing, is the Industry 4.0 uh, paradigm. Uh, this uh, movement uh, was, uh, was formed really in 2011 uh, from a consortium of uh, large manufacturers, mainly based in Germany, and also the, uh, the federal German government as well. It is said that um, Industry 3.0, the, the previous revolution, uh, really came about in the, around about the, the late 1960s uh, with the introduction of uh, uh, robots of manufacturing production lines, uh, which were controlled through uh, uh, programmable logic controllers. So this uh, allowed certainly um, uh, a level of uh, automation, though it was uh, perhaps quite limited in the amount of uh, degrees of freedom that it, it gave to, uh, to manufacturers. Industry 4.0, is looking at uh, actually connecting up robots uh, with other digital systems uh, in a complete uh, digital, uh, in effect, uh, ecosystem, or some kind of a treating manufacturing as almost like a cyber physical system, where uh, each uh, entity within that system is effectively uh, wirelessly connected uh, to each other, and indeed can be uh, kind of uh, thought of as, uh, as more of a holistic digital system. Uh, than was uh, ever possible in Industry 3.0. As you can imagine, uh, this, uh, such systems have uh, a great ability to uh, generate data, but also uh, process data as well. And as we'll see that uh, certainly socio-technical data, uh, data uh, uh, of interest and direct communication to and from uh, humans is also relevant in, in this scenario as well. 
We can see uh, from the evolution of uh, manufacturing, uh, the way that manufacturing is changing in certainly in recent years. Uh, certainly it's the case that uh, we're moving from uh, a world of uh, mass customization or very highly customized products to almost the, the market of one person with a batch size of one. So indeed uh, mass manufactured products but actually uh, tailored and manufactured for individual needs. Now this has the uh, effect of actually uh, uh, manufacturers needing to know what individual consumers want in terms of design, but also in terms of features and look at ways of actually capturing that, that data from consumers and then actually using that in the actual uh, design and build uh, cycle of, uh, of, of products. So bearing this in mind, uh, certainly uh, the changes in uh, consumer uh, needs of this uh, market of one, but also in the, the case of uh, moving from industry 3.0 to industry 4.0, um, this has many effects on the way that uh, manufacturing is now organized, or certainly will be organized in the near future. We have this um, SIM pyramid uh, demonstrating that we have right at the top sort of ERP systems and management systems uh, with decision making, maybe taking some days, in the region of days and months all the way down to the actual field level, so sensors and uh, signaling systems on uh, individual production lines and how that's actually uh, processed. So that's uh, the SIM pyramid that I think uh, most are uh, familiar with in the way that uh, manufacturing certainly has been organised uh, in the past. It's argued by some authors though that this SIM pyramid is being challenged and introduction of industry 4.0 technologies or digitisation of uh, of uh, all of those levels of the SIM pyramid actually causes that pyramid uh, to disintegrate and become uh, much more sort of a, a horizontal, uh, less, less hierarchical structure. So every system can communicate with every other system and it's up to individual manufacturers uh, and actors within supply chains uh, to decide how those systems are best connected together, how they process data and what types of data they actually uh, collect in the first place. Another response to uh, the introduction of uh, automated and autonomous technologies within manufacturing is the rise of the uh, smart factory. Uh, certainly we can see from uh, the differences between uh, smart factory and perhaps traditional factory is that uh, with a traditional factory uh, we will have uh, uh, perhaps a very uh, manual uh, input of data. So data is collected, but uh, it's in kind of a disconnected uh, way from the, from the actual shop floor of, uh, of the factory. Uh, we find that uh, this has been partially addressed by uh, what's known as the uh, virtual factory. So the use of uh, simulation systems and uh, systems that were kind of a semi-connected to the, uh, uh, the shop floor. Uh, this also had the effect of actually reducing the decision cycles uh, from one month back to uh, right, right the way down to one day. So with the smart factory, we can see the use of cyber physical systems, uh, fully digital systems, are allowing that decision cycle to effectively happen in seconds if we, if we want that. Uh, this, of course, has uh, big uh, effects in terms of the amount of data that we're collecting. Uh, but also how we actually process that data and indeed uh, how we visualise that data, uh, perhaps using uh, sort of immersive 3D systems, maybe mixed reality systems, and also using uh, soft computing techniques to actually get the system to display uh, relevant uh, information that uh, we as humans can actually uh, take in and process ourselves. And it's also appropriate at this stage to mention about the concept of uh, digital twin. And digital twin uh, has been seen as a way of actually uh, mapping a physical system, such as a manufacturing production line, into a completely digital and, and synthetic world representation. Uh, certainly from the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in uh, Sheffield, we have these uh, three different types of uh, uh, digital twin, uh, from maybe supervisory, all the way through interactive digital twins, where there's some control that uh, uh, a human would have over a, a, a manual system through a digital representation, all the way through to a, a predictive digital twin, where the whole system, uh, physical system, has been uh, twinned uh, in terms of its digital twin, and indeed you can control pretty much any of uh, the parameters that you want through that 
but also be uh, predictive about uh, how that system is going to perform in the future. And there'll be some self-management within that system as well through uh, artificial intelligence. It's also worth noting that Digital Twin is another way that uh, perhaps through a digital dashboard, we can actually visualize what's happening on the, on the production line and actually uh, process uh, indeed uh, some data that, we're, uh, that uh, we're actually getting back from the system uh, in a way that, uh, that the human can actually uh, uh, more readily understand. The concept of digital twin has also been explored in terms of um, smart products and the actual design of uh, new products or new product development processes. So in terms of intelligent products, that is uh, products that are capable of uh, some sort of digital processing, uh, when they're actually used in the field, uh, we can think of, for example, a, a, uh, a modern car. Uh, actual data on how that uh, product is performing in the real world, it's being, how it's being used by the customer, can be sent back actually to the uh, organization, uh, the manufacturer, and that data can be processed and can be used in the loop of producing uh, uh, new designs of products. And indeed, uh, this paper by Tao describes uh, such, a, such a potential system uh, for using uh, digital twin within the new product development. But this also has a lot to say in terms about how we're actually capturing that data uh, from the intelligent product, uh, how we're actually processing that data, and indeed how we actually in the future build in data from uh, customers in terms of that uh, batch size of one as well, how we design a very uh, design and develop and indeed manufacture highly uh, customised uh, products uh, for our future customer base. Um, recent developments in uh, new sensor types also allowed us to actually capture tacit knowledge uh, from, from, from humans. Um, certainly one of these sensors, or the more famous sensor, is uh, Connect. And what Connect does is that uh, it's uh, a markerless tracking of um, uh, human skeleton. So indeed, uh, anyone uh, actually walking, uh, uh, creating a movement in front of uh, the Connect sensor will be sensed and actually uh, visualized as or were indeed tracked as a, a human skeleton. Um, certainly, uh, this has been used in gaming systems uh, for actual uh, players uh, within within games, but it can also be used in industrial setting to actually capture tacit knowledge of workers. So to be able to actually uh, capture and record uh, uh, physical movements of workers in very complex uh, manual operations. And indeed, this can be used as obviously for new training of uh, workers, but it can also be used uh, perhaps in terms of uh, uh, for use in uh, training robots, or indeed uh, what we call uh, cobots, so robots that actually work alongside humans, but in a safe and, and an efficient manner. So we have seen there are uh, many different uh, sources uh, of, uh, of socio-technical data uh, that can indeed be captured and, uh, and, and potentially processed. Uh, but it's certainly the case that um, when we're actually processing this data and actually providing it back to the human, uh, this question arises of how the human uh, best uh, interacts with uh, highly automated and indeed autonomous systems. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, my opinion and also the opinion of uh, several other authors, that uh, perhaps uh, the audit trail uh, has some uh, uh, relevance within this in effect to actually uh, define kind of like uh, the major stage gates that uh, an automated system will uh, go through uh, in order to actually come up with a decision and indeed represent these to the human in a much more understandable, perhaps even process flow uh, uh, format that the human can actually understand and interact with in a, uh, a short space of time. So certainly we're seeing a lot of developments in technology such as uh, XML tagging, and uh, semantics, actually semantically describing data that we're capturing. But also there's the use of perhaps uh, the, uh, we've heard of uh, blockchain being used certainly in the finance industry, but perhaps using this dis distributed ledger technology uh, with the uh, effect, uh, the mining of uh, event logs. So uh, logs that are being recorded by uh, automated systems, but also indeed uh, on the production line, indeed, indeed machines and, and robots on the production line and actually being able to, to mine this, uh, uh, this data, uh, represent it in some sort of a, a much more uh, simplified uh, stage gate or indeed a process flow uh, that indeed a human can understand. 
this is also the case in terms of working with intelligence systems of trying to find out how the intelligence system uh, came about its decision and indeed trying to boil that down to uh, the major the major stage gates of that i think in summary uh, human in a loop is going to be uh, not so much less important in the future but much more important in the future and will be key to actually the development of uh, more highly automated systems or systems that actually work uh, with the human rather than uh, simply replacing the human. Um, it's probably uh, going to be the case that uh, uh, the capturing of human knowledge or tacit technology is going to be uh, key within this, but it's very much uh, my opinion uh, that uh, the human has uh, the final say and indeed uh, the human has the ability uh, through uh, such systems such automated systems that actually explain their decision making to actually be able to uh, press uh, the stop button on a system and actually interrogate why a decision has been made. If we find that the, the highly automated system or the or lights at factory of the future um, uh, isn't actually operating in the way that the way that we want. So thank you for listening to this presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. That's fantastic. So um, what we're going to do next is in uh, small groups, we gather around a virtual whiteboard. And on that whiteboard are, are three questions that we'd like you to, to tackle in the next half an hour. So they're going to be written on there, but just briefly, they for this theme, they essentially cover um, what is the current status, what's the knowledge gap, and what are the research questions that we need to address to fulfill that, that knowledge gap. And basically the idea is we're going to take these white um, away with us later. So um, the information in them will influence our next funding call. So it's supposed to be a, you know, a two way process. Um, and like I say, this information will feed into what we, uh, the, the calls that we put out next. Um, so I say the instructions are, are on the whiteboards. It'd be useful if you could uh, perhaps nominate a, a note taker for each, each table. Um, like I said, we're going to take the whiteboards away with us uh, afterwards. And uh, myself and Joe will kind of be wandering around the uh, virtual room. So not, not necessarily there to contribute to the, the whiteboards themselves, but just in case you have any, any questions. Um, so Joe, I think that we're probably ready for that session to, to start. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Just at the right moment, I've got an ice cream van just outside my house. <laughs> So that's useful. Um, I hope the uh, the whiteboards were were good and you got used to them. Um, we've got two volunteers who have uh, yeah okay. <laughs> I know where you live, Stefania. <laughs> I'll drop her around in a minute. Um, yeah, so we've got two volunteers who have very kindly said they're just just very very briefly, and it's only to the people in this uh, in this session. Just summarise what you guys um, were able to talk about. So the first one is Stefania, who will be getting an ice cream soon, along with Susan. So, uh, can is there a way to share the whiteboard or uh, you... the, the whiteboard we had on? Well, in any case, I copy and paste. The, um, I can share my screen. So this. I just will we'll just summarize a little bit what we discuss. So in answer of uh, question one, I think first things emerge is how to gradually integrate uh, human in the loop. So usually it's missing uh, in the middle of the system. So it, uh, the interaction come at the beginning of design and basically at, at the end. So this was what the biggest things uh, and others, uh, comment is about that those systems are usually black boxes so um, and there is a lack of trust um, and this sometimes can be seen in an example for autonomous vehicle in space application um, so especially because it's a data driven based decision and then um, okay so the question also is how human interacts in the system uh, is not captured by the current way in which uh, manufacturing process are, are done and the socio-technical systems are missing so in relation of question two uh, we have discussed about um, sorry it's very very badly written by me but uh, how can we make the system um, 
be trusted and how can uh, the human knowledge be put in the in a closed loop system and it, i raise also a question about how to maintain rd capacity because if you think about space mission they take many years of development so this is another issue so how do you transfer the knowledge in the system um and uh, and also about ethics. So how do you trust? Our, we know when we make decision, we make also ethical decisions. So how you do you feed this in the machine? And finally, question three, uh, we raise this following question. So how do we integrate the knowledge from human to machines for AI? So uh, methods to capture the knowledge are still missing. Uh, and also experience, how do you embed the knowledge in a data-driven system? So many years of experience in a se specific sector, uh, how do you transfer this on the machine? And how do we make the deployment of these data-driven systems? So how can we make them easier to understand and not only as a black box? And how do we enable multiple interaction and collaborations? Um, and I think this is kind of all the things we discussed. Great. I will stop sharing. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, I think um, absolutely. That's really, really cool. I think. Any one of my group want to add something? Maybe I missed something. <laughs> okay, I, th no. I think they could do yeah, it no. on the chat. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of issues around interpretability, ethics, and even, I guess, the, the legal stuff who's responsible if uh, if an algorithm is having to influence a decision and i think you know a lot of this stuff is fundamentally these we call it ai it's not it's not intelligent these things and they don't learn like we learn i think humans are very good at learning in a way um where they can easily generalize whereas i think these algorithms are, can outperform a human being if we've got huge amounts of data that focus in on one really specific it's not, it's not the they generalize that gap between what they can actually do and what they're perhaps sold at is, is a big problem. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I think table. <laughs> We've made the ice cream van, by the way. Go on. Right here? Hello? Is it working? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, all right. Uh, thanks. Yeah, so I kind of I got volunteered for this. And I, I'm not sure that we entirely followed the, the question structure. We just sort of had a discussion. But um, it was a good discussion. Um, I think some of the key points that we brought up were, um, firstly, how do we manage um, change and impacts on society of, of these sort of digital technologies and increased automation and um, sort of obviously these these sort of solutions are going to improve productivity, but they may um, in the short term, especially displace um, certain jobs. Um, in the long run, we we do believe that they're going to improve the number of jobs out there and create higher skilled jobs but we need to manage that those impacts on society so um yeah how do we do that um the other one i think was already mentioned so trust in things like black box solutions um, i made the comment that a lot of engineers out there they they like to understand how things work and presenting them with a a black box solution to say okay well just use this and it'll help you manage your process might be a challenge i think um another comment that that was made um, maybe oh hello you can just see pete's smiling face i'll carry on um another comment that we made was uh, how to sort of manage interactions between universities and industry to ensure that students are coming into industry with the the right skills to be able to contribute to productivity straight away. Um, and then also, how do we increase understanding within manufacturing communities of what these digital tools are and what they mean to them? Um, I think 
that was kind of around nomenclature and things like that. So if you talk about digital twin, what does that actually mean? And, and what does it mean to any individual manufacturing community? Because it may mean different things, or it will mean different things for a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the key barriers to get to overcome to sort of increase the utilization of these digital technology in industry um, is increasing understanding at all levels. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, it looks like we've <laughs> kind of lost Pete. Face. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it looks like we've lost Pete, but I think that's pretty much the end of the session anyway. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and giving your feedback. Uh, there's another two uh, parallel sessions about to start. Uh, if you want to go along to one of those, there's one on regulation and one on resilience. Okay. Thank you, everyone.